and welcome to the Idea Space Podcast, a place for women who want to create the life they've been dreaming of. This is where women come to learn how to get their ideas out of their head and into the world. Whether you've wanted to create a better relationship, job, business, hobby, or a better self, I bet there's something more that you want, and it's time you were able to get it without feeling overwhelmed, alone, or confused. I'm your host, Jen Liddy, a high school teacher turned entrepreneur. It's my mission to help women bring their ideas to life and get what they want without feeling guilty, selfish, or confused. If you're tired of your dream living inside your brain and are ready to have what you want, you're in the right place. And I promise you can have it and you can stay sane while doing it. Let's go. So a big reason why many women don't bring their ideas to life, don't grow their businesses, don't do the things they want to do is because they tamp themselves down because they are worried about what other people will think. So that's judgment, but they're also so consumed with making sure other people are okay that they forget to put themselves on the list. That's people pleasing. And so today I have asked my best friend, Leslie, who you guys met the last time we did an awesome interview. And P.S. Both of us, like, how many times did you re-listen to our interview? Because I just enjoyed like hearing the conversation over and over again. I thought it was really interesting. It, it was a couple times. <laughs> it was a couple times for me too. So I asked Leslie to come back because she is a self-proclaimed people pleaser. And she has agreed to talk about how people pleasing, you know, the work she's done on it and how it's affected her and it's affected our friendship, but it affects everything in her life. So I wanted to say, I'm so proud of you and I'm so excited to talk to you because this is a thing that plagues so many of my clients. Well, I'm happy to be here. I'm a little terrified, but I'm happy to be here. I appreciate it. So let's just get started. Can you quickly tell the story of like how you were preparing for the interview and what aha you had about that? Sure. You were kind enough to send me some questions ahead of time so that I could kind of wrap my head around what we'd be talking about because I had really no idea other than people pleasing. And so I was a diligent student and I copied it and pasted it into a new file and I started just, you know, running through my answers and typing out some things to get my brain kind of warmed up and had this moment of realization that I was like reading my answer and then thinking about it and thinking about how I needed to tweak it so that everyone would hear it the way that I hoped that they would hear it, that they would get the most out of it. And that I just started spiraling into people pleasing even before there were any. (laughs) So I hit pause. I actually deleted the document and I said, I just, I need to not pre-prepare because it will not be as authentic and and real. That's good so, I have awesome. no idea what's going to come out of my mouth. So Which you're see. always the best interviews. So awesome. Okay, oh, good. So let's talk like, how do you describe people pleasing? I would say for me, people pleasing is always being hyper aware of social situations or relationships and how I personally influence them either positively or negatively. And when you're aware of that, always trying to be one step ahead and making sure you're taking care of the people around you. So typically putting their needs before your own until you're not even sure what your needs are because your default is to just take care of everything around you first. Wow. And it's never taken care of, so you never quite get to yourself. So... When did you realize you were a people pleaser? What, what was your like aha moment when you realized like, I don't even know what I friggin' want anymore? Oh, it was at least high school, I would say. Okay. Maybe younger. Oh, I remember the exact moment, actually. Wow. I was sitting in a college lecture and the teacher, a huge lecture hall, and the teacher had said, tell me three descriptive words about yourself, like the characteristics that just boil down to who you are. And she just immediately pointed at me and I like froze. I was like, shit. I had no, no answers and just turned bright red. I was freaking out. And she's like, um, so why do you think it is that you have no idea who you are, what you want or what any of your, your characteristics are? And of course, mortified in that moment, I didn't have an answer. And then I, I went, you know, back to my dorm full of shame and mortified. And I started thinking, I'm like, I don't even know why I'm at this school. I don't even know why I'm an occupational therapist. I don't know why I'm doing any of this. And as I kind of traced it back, it was just always 
trying to make people around me proud, you know, wanting my parents to be proud, wanting to do the right thing, picking a career that, you know, you'd have a job when you got out of college, like trying to check off all the boxes to just be the good kid, the good student and Mm -hmm. take the right path. So in that moment, I was like, oh shit, like I need to figure some of this stuff out. That's a big moment. I remember for me, it happened later. I wasn't, I don't, I would never classify myself as much of a people pleaser. Like that's not my first thing. Like that's, but I would sit, I would like go to a movie or a play and I would worry about how the other people in the movie theater were enjoying the movie or the play. Like, mm-hmm. why does that matter? And, and how right. can I even- and, and how is that your responsibility? Exactly. <laughs> but, but I'm worried like, oh my God. And I'm not even talking about the person I was with. Like, oh, is my oh, yeah. boyfriend or my friend? I'm talking about like all the people in the theater right. and that old lady over there, how's she dealing with the cursing or the nudity or whatever? Oh, totally. It I still makes my like, skin crawl. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I get it. I get it to some degree. So mm-hmm. because everything that we do serves us in some way mm-hmm. and we do it because of that, how did people pleasing serve you for a long time? I think it just makes you feel safe. I think it makes you feel worthy, lovable, all those like deep things that you're looking for. If you can serve other people, if you can, if you can predict what they need and provide it, you feel like you are indispensable. You feel like you are giving them what they need. And in turn, they will see the value in you as a person. So like you're valuable in the world because you can provide for other people rather than just being valuable in the world because you're in the world. Right. right. That's, not a, that's not a message I ever remember <laughs> hearing. <laughs> so this whole, this must be exhausting to constantly be thinking about what does this person need? What does this person need? What does this person need? How to take care of this person? I would say it's exhausting, but it's also a skill that you kind of get a little hit of adrenaline from. Like it's also... You know, you can also be proud of that ability because there is, you know, there's the nurturing that comes along with it that is, Mm -hmm. I think, a a healthy thing to put out there into the world if you're doing it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, always just trying to put out other people's fires that are not your responsibility is exhausting. Yeah. One of the things about you that I know from just being around you so much and the people pleasing that you used to do versus what you do now, I mean you're so kind and you're so thoughtful and you're always like able to help somebody solve a problem. And I always know that if I come to you, you can help. Were you worried about like losing that element of yourself when you decided I needed to, you needed to scale back on the people pleasing? Uh, no, because that is, I think that's so much of me. I just love solving problems. Mm -hmm. I think it's just putting it in a different container. It's, it's having the boundaries around that so that I can actually give help when I know I'm able to and have the energy to. And Mm -hmm. if I don't, it's not that I completely put somebody off, but I can say, let's talk about it, you know, at this time, or let's look at it in in this way. But I used to drop everything and just Mm -hmm. run, solve. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that being the case in the old paradigm, what was a moment you remember where you're like, this is not serving me anymore. This is really causing me either pain or discomfort or suffering or stuckness. I think uh, there, this was one of the questions that I did read and ooh, it's hard to come up with the yeah. exact um, examples, but I know that in leaving method, that was one place, you know, mm-hmm. I stayed in the business that I wasn't comfortable in because I didn't want to let people down. Right. There was that sense of responsibility, which, you know, there should be some sense of responsibility, but Mm -hmm. you know, when you think people are going to die, if you (laughs) make yourself work at a gym anymore, you know, like (laughs) it got a little narcissistic, probably a little bit, you know, what I do is so important. Mm. If I'm not there to save everybody, what's, Mm. you know, they couldn't survive without me. And then also when I was really trying to stick in the world of entrepreneurship, because Mm. Mm -hmm. I was so worried what people would think if I left, you know, they knew me as a certain way and I wanted to live up to that and I didn't want to disappoint anybody. So that's just kind of another 
another branch of people pleasing. Yeah. It's delightful. I bet it's been like a lot of little, a lot of little nicks, like a lot of little like right, things right. in the armor that you're like, oh, there it is again. There it is again. There it is again. Mm-hmm. Every right. day. It's not, Every day. It's not one, it's not one thing that you do and boom, you're not a people pleaser anymore. No. And I will always be. I will. I, I'm sure of that. And because I do think that there, you know, there's a shadow and light to everything. I do think there is a, a really wonderful side of people pleasing, which I prefer to think of as nurturing and, Mm -hmm. and being a helper, you know, but, but if you're not taking care of yourself first and you don't have healthy boundaries, then it quickly can go to that Mm -hmm. shadow side. Do you think, so do you, would you say boundaries are one of the most important elements of a people please, and I do love this like dichotomy of people pleasing on one end and nurturing on the other, and like kind of trying to find the find the one that fits for each situation. Mm-hmm. So I'm hearing you say that boundaries were important for you in figuring that out. Yeah, definitely. Other than boundaries, I think also one of the things that that really helped me kind of be aware of the people pleasing and also to to put it in perspective for me was when i start thinking about what the point of people pleasing is it really is manipulative i mean it really is a way to control the world around you by kind of taking the first step in and fixing things for people so that you kind of create order out of chaos but it's to serve you it's not it's really not nurturing. It's really not serving the people around you. If you are deciding what should happen, making it happen immediately at really at any cost, because you think that it's, it's the way to solve the problem or to be seen as a hero. That's really a fascinating perspective. I had never thought of that. Yeah. You take away the opportunity for the other person to fix it themselves. Right. Or to ask for help. Because asking for help is such an important way to show yourself that you think you're worthy of getting help. And it's such a, it's a, it's a big ask and it's a hard ask. But if you step in before somebody is prepared to do that for themselves, it can lead to them feeling entitled to it. It can lead to them feeling incapable of asking for help. You know, it just kind of strips that away from, from somebody, that opportunity. Yeah. Are there any strategies that you found were helpful for you while you were trying to kind of overcome the habits that you had created around people pleasing? I mean, really thinking about that last piece I mentioned about kind of the manipulative Mm -hmm. side of it. If I was making a decision or I felt like often it'll come up in my body like this, this high vibration of like, oh, I need to act. I need to do something. So when I get that sensation, I kind of, it's, it's more of like a check-in to see, you know, what is it? And am I trying to get rid of my anxiety by just stepping in and taking over for somebody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am I just trying to solve right now for somebody else? Is this, so really it's awareness, you know, where, where is this coming from? Do I want to help someone in a really loving, kind way? Or am I trying to just assert my value in a situation so that I feel like they like me? And, yes. and that's so, you know, it's that's such a, stuff. it's deep stuff. And none it's of it's hard fun to, to talk no, about in public. No, I know. I, that's why I'm saying like, it's so amazing that you're talking about this because so many of us struggle with, like, if there's a spectrum of people pleasing, so many of us struggle with it and it fills us up in some way. Mm-hmm. And it works as a really great excuse a lot of the time. Like, oh, oh yeah. we, can't, we can't do this thing for ourselves because we have to take care of this other person. and The martyr. The martyrdom. So fun. In the sense of, the sense of like, I don't really have to figure this out. I can just step in and take action. I don't have to figure out where my anxiety is coming from. Which right. what you're saying is it's coming from a lack of self-worth. Right. And that is deep deep doo-doo to walk around in. Yeah. Well, it's also crappy stuff to acknowledge. Like it doesn't feel good. (laughs) That's not a fun thing to, you know, to talk about, but it's, you know, if you really think about why we do everything, it, I think it boils down to fear Mm -hmm. and most everybody, if you, if you're really honest with yourself, 
it's that fear of being unworthy. It's that fear of being unlovable. It's that fear of being inadequate. Yeah. And you can usually trace any shitty behaviors back to that. Do you remember Maslow's hierarchy from college? Oh, I do. Those are like the base needs. Nobody admits right. that they have them, but those right there, what you said, like a lack of belonging, a lack of, you know, I, nobody loves me. Those, right. those were the base fears. Right. And I think that the thing that we always forget is, you know, we, we build that up with people in our lives. And I, I know I'm loved. I mean, I, I have an amazing family, an amazing tribe of people around me. But those messages are just so ingrained that they're like these little wormholes that lead all the way down to the bottom. And sometimes you step in that pitfall and you just plummet. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard to kind of fill in all those spaces so you can be self-actualized. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's always a pitfall. So the number one strategy that you said for dealing with it was awareness. Mm -hmm. But I also know that you have worked really hard on boundaries. Yes. Do you have any advice around boundaries? Oh, they're so hard. They're so hard. <laughs> when you're a people pleaser, they're, they feel impossible. Because the fear um, is what? That you're going to disappoint somebody? Yes. And then what will they think of you? Okay. You'll be seen as selfish. Uh, and I think for most people pleasers, that is like the worst possible mm -hmm. stigma, you know, to be seen as a selfish person when you really want to give, but honestly, you're giving from a selfish place if we're, mm, if we're going there, if we're really going to be honest. Yeah. So, and of course the irony is when you put boundaries in place, people then know what expectations you have, they have appropriate expectations, and then you're able to give so much more kindly and freely and in a way that feels good to everybody because they don't think it'll be thrown back in their face with resentment, which happens with a lot of people pleasers. Right. That I know of. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know anybody personally, but there are resentful heard, people pleasers out there. I've yeah. heard. <laughs> so it just makes it so much cleaner that, you know, you're giving from a place of really wanting to give and yeah. of knowing that you're able to, you know, you have enough to give at that point. So ironically, it, it feels like selfish is the word you're afraid of, but Honestly, it's more generous to have boundaries because then a person knows what's acceptable, what you can give. Like it, it, it actually right. allows you to be more generous. It's the opposite. Right. And then there's no manipulation. There's no string attached. There's, yes. it's just, this is what I have to give you. This is all I have to give you. I hope this helps. And then the way I talk about it with some of my clients is that we, we train people, we train people to teach us in right. a certain way. And so if you're, so let's say mm -hmm. like you're a mom and you're mm -hmm. constantly available for your kids and you, they, they forget something at home, you drop it off. They want a certain thing, you make it for them. Like it's just constantly, you please, 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 please. But of course you get depleted, like, because you're human right. and then, but they've been trained to know they can constantly come back to the well. But this time they come back to the well and the well is empty. And it's not only empty, but it's grumpy and screamy and all the dwarves. <laughs> and cranky. And everyone's terrified. Yeah. Right. And they're right. like, wait, this isn't fair because this is what you set up. You set up right. for me that I can come back to this well and it's just never going to be dry. And so mm -hmm. I feel like once my clients can see that when you put boundaries into, the pla into place, it it's really better for everybody because then they know like, oh, the well might be dry. I might need to check in with that. Right. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, and, and with parenting, you know, you are, you're teaching entitlement. You're teaching mm. other people's needs don't need to be part of the that's right. equation. And yeah. um, I mean, parenting brings on a whole another thing. And then, you know, and then when you have those freak outs at your kids because you're depleted, that's teaching your kids to be people pleasers. Like then they're like, Oh, what did we do? Yeah. How can we make mom happy? It's our responsibility. You know, we did this and we need to make her happy. And we teach kids that, you know, even our own emotions aren't up to us, mm -hmm. that it's dependent on their behavior. So it's yeah. just this like deep, ugh. it's boundaries are good. Like. So we, I know that you've done years and years of work on this. What benefits have you seen from doing the work of breaking the habit of over people pleasing. Oh boy. I mean, I have a lot more energy. Mm -hmm. I know 
I don't feel that I'm putting out as many fires. So the sense of urgency is very different. And I can also ask for help and do it in a much kinder way mm. than I used to. Can you somebody know, get in here and clean up this room? Right. Right. Because <laughs> right. when you're depleted, you are not you are not in a loving place. No, you're screaming. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, everything just feel like there's just more ease. There's mm. more, and don't get me wrong. I have a long freaking way to go. I mean, there's progress, but it's slow. It's been years. It's slow. I don't but think it's slow. I don't think you see yourself like I see you and all the work you've done and all the changes you've made and you you put boundaries into place and you're kind and loving, you know, it's, you're, you're generous and you take time for yourself and that makes you better for a better friend, a better wife, a better mom. Like it, it, I've, I've seen huge, huge shifts in you. Thank you. And I think honestly, what you just said is like the and. Yeah. You're, you're never taught that there's an and. <laughs> you're either giving and generous or you're selfish. Like yeah. it, there's, there's just a way to, you know, it was like when I finally understood that leaders could be compassionate. I'm like, wait, those can't exist on the same plane. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing, you know, nurturers can put themselves first because yes. it's the whole oxygen mask, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So for somebody who really wants to make this shift and sees the benefits and like is like, well, you know, I really want to have something of my own and I really can see that it would benefit my children to have me be more me. Mm -hmm. What advice do you give to people like this? Well, I think the first thing is get prepared to get uncomfortable mm. because when you do change a dynamic, especially with your family, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a deep seated, long standing way that the family knows to operate. Mm -hmm. It's going to, it's going to feel real yucky at first. It's going to be really uncomfortable and you're going to doubt the changes you're making because everybody around you is going to say like, you're abandoning us. What do you, yes. what are you doing? Yes. And that's a terrible feeling as a mom. It's terrible. So it's really, I think, having a mantra or having a practice or having a friend who can remind you why you're doing it mm -hmm. that, you know, like you just said, like celebrating the, the little victories along the way and reminding them how much progress that they're making because because it's hard and you're going to feel like you are abandoning people, mm -hmm. you know, and when you are such a caregiver and come from that place, it feels like the worst thing you could be doing. Yeah. And the one thing I remember you and I having conversations about a lot is like, it's okay for other people to be uncomfortable. It's a good practice for them because the world makes us all uncomfortable. So if we've spent right. all of our time making sure that everybody else is comfortable, they go out into the world never don't not having those um those skills. Right. Right. And as a parent, what's a what's a better thing to teach your kids when they are still in a safe place? Right. And so one of the things I talk to my kids about, you know, in the beginning, like when I went back to work and I shifted the whole paradigm on them mm -hmm. and they all freaked out was the importance of choosing discomfort. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it started to become, you know, when we were making decisions as a, as a family or they were struggling with, you know, do I want to do this or do I not talking about how each time you make that little choice to try something that's a little uncomfortable, you grow. It just gives you yeah. more room to grow and showing them that moms need to do that too. Right. Know? is really important because that they're watching everything that we do. Yeah. And so if they can see us actually caring for ourselves and doing the hard things and being honest about them, you know, like I, I'll talk to my kids, like being gluten free. <laughs> they're, they're so funny. Like they're always like, how do you feel about it right now? <laughs> there's birthday cake, mom. Um, like we know you can't have it or there's, you know, wh whatever the case may be and saying, you know, I'm choosing it. It's yeah. uncomfortable. I'd love to do that, but it's the right choice for me and my body. They're like, damn, <laughs> like you're so enlightened. <laughs> right. You know, I think if we can go around and say, it's okay for people to be uncomfortable. It's okay for people to be disappointed in mm -hmm. me. Like they're, we don't really have control 
over whether somebody's disappointed in us or angry at us or whatever. Right. And when we let that go, there's just like so much freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's also very hard to convince that person that it's okay that they are the ones that are uncomfortable. Yes. yes right. <laughs> you know, we're, we're designed to seek comfort, you know, at all costs. And so if the people pleaser is now the one who is putting this discomfort on somebody else, Ugh, it's hard for everybody. Yeah, it's so, so what I'm hearing you say is you need support, you need awareness, but you also kind of need to be kind with yourself and know that it's kind of slow going. Yeah. And, and you can make changes quickly, but I think the faster the change, the more pushback you get, mm -hmm. um, which is fine. You just have want to, to be prepared for that. Cause yeah. if you're not prepared for that, you will swing back the other way and start yeah. taking care of everybody and apologizing for everything that you put them through. And then, and then you just get deeper into it. Totally see that. I could totally see that. Yeah. I think this is super helpful for people of any age of like, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're not an entrepreneur, whether you have a job and a boss or whether you work at home, like right. in whatever relationship you're in, examining your people pleasing versus your nurturing and like becoming highly aware of that. I think this is a really valuable conversation because the more that people can take care of themselves, I just think, I think that the vibration on the planet would be higher if people could just be like, yep. I need this. I'm putting my oxygen mask on. I'm going to empower you to do the same. And I promise you, you will be better off for it rather right. than everybody scrambling all the time to read other people's minds and take care of other people's emotions. Like it's like holding somebody emotionally hostage, right? Uh, you have to be okay for me to feel good. Like, holy crap. Don't put that on somebody else. It's a lot of responsibility. It is. Yeah, and it doesn't, words? and it, well, it, to that point, it doesn't allow people room to grow because then you're saying, I don't want you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable if you're uncomfortable. Yes. And if you're not allowed to be uncomfortable, you can't grow. Right. So you're basically saying, stay exactly how you are because that's how I feel safe. <laughs> right. Don't grow. Don't evolve. Don't change. Right. And we're all going to be okay. And, that's and whether, so, we're, so whether we're parents or entrepreneurs or just humans, like, we are all constantly growing. That's that's part of the that's part of the deal. Well, you hope so. You would hope so. Well, the people I want to be around are. <laughs> right. Well, I can't tell you how grateful I am for this. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks You're for so having generous. Me. Do something that scares me. It makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> I can feel myself crying as we talk. <laughs> I'm so good. <laughs> Thank you, my love. All right, love you. Love <laughs> you too. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the Idea Space in your podcast app or tell that friend of yours who'd really love to bring her idea to life about it. If you'd be so kind to leave a review, then together we can help more women with the desire to create the life she wants find this podcast. Isn't it time we got our ideas out of our head and into the world? Remember, you can grab my free resource, Bring Your Idea to Life in Three Easy Steps, even if you don't have the time, by visiting me over at jenliddy.com forward slash time. I'll see you next time. And remember, all you need to do is take the very next step you know how to. Bye.